Welcome to Real Estate 360 Live with Ryan Sloper, the trusted name in real estate radio. Now, here's Ryan Sloper. Welcome everyone to Real Estate 360 Live. I'm your host, Ryan Sloper. For those of you not familiar with our podcast, we do a weekly podcast on all things real estate from interest rates to the economy to what's happening in Washington. Anything that affects our local real estate markets will be covered here. Joining me on our panel today, as he does every week, is Louis Camerosano. Louis is a former school teacher, a former attorney, and a former general manager of a major real estate quarter. He's often cited as a real estate industry expert in the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, CNN Money, Fox Business, Smart Money, MSN, and numerous others. We're going to dive into what's been going on in the markets over the last week, what's going on with interest rates and the overall economy, and, and how that can affect you and your real estate decisions um, now and moving forward to the future. Louis, how are you doing today? I'm doing grand, Ryan. How are you? I'm doing fantastic myself. Um, you know, I, I would say you know, since the last time we spoke last week, we've ac actually had um, a lot going on. Obviously, we've got the big um, uh, global news with what's going on over there in Syria, uh, which has put some actually some downward pressure on our rates, as well as uh, there's been what many would consider positive economic news, although you and I tend to read between the lines. Um, we have now had mortgage interest rates at the highest level in two years. Yesterday, rates got much worse, um, which we'll start with. We had, um, let's see, the ADP private payroll came in at 176000 which the original consensus estimates were for a gain of 157, but that was revised upward to 180000 So that reading of 176 was pretty much right in line with what they expected. Um, in order for mortgage interest rates to get much better, there would have had to have been a big miss to the downside on that, and we simply didn't get anything. Um, you mean a big and, miss so that people would think the Fed wouldn't taper? Correct. Yep. So everything's just pretty much like hunky-dory and, and, and no big deal. Uh, we'll just keep moving ahead. No no reason for the for the Fed to think otherwise. You know, they're not going to say that things are getting worse or better because the data is not really missing so much worse. Like if we had that ADP that came in at maybe like 120000 or something like that, that would have probably been a big enough miss to give a boost to interest rates. So that came out. Then we had initial jobless claims, which fell 9000 last week and came in 323000 which was better than the consensus estimates of 330000 So that coupled with that ADP data gave, you know, traders reason to basically bet that today's non-farm payrolls which will come out at 830, will be better than expected and potentially give Fed, the Fed enough data to start tapering on September 18th. Now, do I think that, that that's going to happen? Absolutely not. I don't think so. I think the Fed's going to come back in and say, I, I still don't see enough significant data to say that the shift is turning the right way. Um, I think traders are very optimistic, and they'll take any bit of news and run with it. Um, but it's just so funny because of how dependent we've become upon taking this news, consuming this news, and then saying, okay, what the hell is the Fed going to do next, right? <laughs> I mean, we used to be able to take this economic news, and we had some more of, uh, more of a normal market, which would just say, okay, well, guess what? Stock market's going to go up today, and mortgage interest rates are going to go down today based upon the actual news that we have, not based upon, okay, this is the news that we have. Now, how is the Fed going to react? And after the Fed reacts, what is that going to do to interest rates? I mean, it's just a completely different dynamic than what we've seen, you know, from five, ten years ago to where we are today. What's your thoughts on, on um, you know, the reports, the labor reports, and, and where we're headed today for, for the um, non-farm payrolls? Well, you're, you're absolutely right, Ryan. The, the whole game now is watching the Fed because of quantitative easing and whether they're going to continue it, add to it, take it away, reduce it, taper it, whatever. And, and so all the data lo is looked at through that lens. Um, the ADT report was nothing spectacular. If you were in a real recovery, you'd have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of new jobs, not the 172,000 that they reported. The um, initial jobless claims data is down in the low 300s, 300,000, 331,000. It was better than expected. But as we point out week after week, that's a function that the labor participation rate is lower now, so there's fewer people left in the job market to fire. And that is, I think, statistically now provable because if you look at the number of people that are now employed that were employed uh, five years ago versus the number of people that were employed five years ago, that number is fewer. And we've seen companies 
uh, lay off people over the last five years in large numbers. So there's just fewer people left to fire, or they've already moved their employees over to um, part-time employment. So right now what you have going into uh, the Fed meeting in September when they first signal might be the months that they taper, you really have horrific economic news, and you have even more horrific economic news coming down the pike. And yet the traders are thinking and that, we're go- that the Fed is going to taper because the economy is getting better. The headline yesterday in the, um, the media are all you know, good economic data yesterday. I just don't see it. But if you look at what's coming up, you got the congressional debt ceiling debate, which isn't going to be pretty. You have Syria, which either way is going to be uh, harmful to the markets. It seems like the president is, is gung-ho on uh, dropping bombs on Syria. It seems like Congress is going to vote him down. Um, so whether he drops the bombs or not, if he drops the bombs, it's very expensive. It's a billion dollars. Uh, you're going to have problems with uh, internet, you know, uncertainty of what's happening in the world because you have a fluid situation with Russia, China, Iran getting into the mix and so on. If he doesn't drop the bombs and he listens to Congress, the, the United States, you know, could be perceived as looking weak. Uh, that's not good for the, the, uh, the dollar. Um, then you've got Obamacare coming up in, in January. That's going to be, no matter you're in favor of that program or not, um, that's going to be added costs on the economy. Um, you've got the interest rates have risen already without even a taper. Uh, so that's already going to slow down the real estate market, and that's not good for the economy. You've got oil oil at $110 a barrel. That cannot be good for the economy. That raises the cost of, of all fixed finished goods. And then, of course, as we talked about before we got on the show, exports are down, which means the United States is, is not really sending, you know, it's whatever industrial – uh, products it makes overseas in a good amount. Be, and that's because uh, the, since the Fed started uh, the taper talk, uh, the foreign markets have collapsed. The emerging markets are having a lot of trouble now, so they're not going to be able to purchase our goods. So really the economy, Ryan, if you look at it, is is doing poorly. It's not in a recovery. I say it's in a reverse recovery. It's in a revocery. And it's headed the wrong way. What's ahead of us is worse than what's already happened. So the recovery is over as far as I'm concerned. And how we navigate through this, uh, the next few months is, is really going to be a challenge. And I think there's a very high probability you're going to get a stock market crash in, in the next couple of months because the economy is weak, as Bernanke said in his congressional testimony, and cannot withstand higher rates. When he said that, the, the tenure was in the in the twos. Now it's now it's almost three uh, percent. There already are higher rates, and they haven't even done anything. They haven't even tapered yet. You've pointed out all along they're not going to taper because of the issues. I think they'll actually try it, uh, and then use Siri or something else as a as a cover or just whatever the reaction is, and then get right back at right back at the printing. But by then, it's the damage has been done. Because here's what I want your thoughts on, Ryan. Remember, they have not tapered at all, and that the $85 billion a month that they spend, the purpose of which was to keep interest rates low. Well, they're still spending it, but rates are going higher in anticipation of them not spending it. So even if they were to come back, what do you think will happen if they say, oh, sorry, only kidding, didn't mean uh, that taper talk, we're really going to continue buying uh, U.S. Treasuries and mortgage-backed securities – Will that actually drive rates down, or will they continue to go higher, or will they need to spend more? Well, based upon what we've seen from from basically traders in Wall Street, basically they move in lockstep with what, whatever the Fed actually thinks. So it would actually, I think, take the Fed having a complete reversal um, of, of opinion here and basically coming out and saying, hey, guys, you know, I, we thought that things were moving in the right direction. They're actually moving in the wrong direction. And we need to basically correct this. And the way we need to correct this is we need to buy more of more of securities and treasuries. Because guess what? What we thought was going to happen, and now that we've seen the data, which I'm, I want to see the data from the next, from you know, from now to the end of this year, beginning of spring. Because as I as I suggested, Louis, everybody that I've talked to on the street, whether it's other real estate agents, whether it's other loan officers, mortgage professionals, anybody that's in the industry, has all said that. Um, as a result of the, the increase in interest rates over the last couple of months, 
the business has just fallen off the map from where it was, okay? So there's all these lagging indicators that, uh, of things that won't actually be pumped into the media for, what, three or four months from now. Uh, so I think that realistically the Fed has to look at this and say, wow, we haven't even tapered and interest rates are already headed up to the 5% range. <laughs> right. What, what would happen if we if we actually did taper come September? Are they going to go to six? Because that would be completely devastating to the overall economy. Because we it, can't. These it could be Ryan though that they, that's priced in. Do you think it's priced in, or you think if they were to taper, it would actually go higher? You know, I, I would I would actually say that it would go higher because I think that even more it, w- it would basically send signals for people to say, oh, you know what. The economy is moving around. Let's jump back into the stock market. The more money is just going to flee, the, the only the 15% or, or 15, 20% that's out there from the private money that's buying up any of these more respect securities would leave there and go back into the stock market and, and, and pump that up even further. So you're saying um, that if they were to taper, it would signal a direction that they're going to do more. Absolutely. You're saying they, what they have to do is not only not taper, but have to say going forward – we're going to buy even more mortgage-backed securities, buy even more treasury bonds, and set a clear signal. That's the only way they will reverse it is what you're saying. They can't yeah, just not taper and say exactly. we're going to wait and see. Yep, they have to give a clear signal that that's not their intention. <coughs> and actually what their intentions are, they actually need to buy more. Because um, they've never came out and said, hey, you know, they said we realize that the economy is slowing, but they actually need to say, no, we're going in completely the wrong direction, and if we don't get things straightened out, this could get much worse. But they don't want to say that, you know what I mean, because that would put fear and panic into the overall market. But I just don't see any way around. You, with interest rates rising up, it's already put people that could buy homes into a situation where they can no longer afford, because when you go from, like, low threes up to the 5%, it changes affordability. Big time. Now, we can argue all day long on whether 5% interest rates are great, because I still think they are, but that's not changing the affordability factor for many people. And as you and I have spoke all the time, Lewis, that we're not increasing jobs here. We're not increasing wages. So if we have interest rates rising at a pace that's nowhere close to what people's wages are doing, what do you think is going to happen to home affordability? Where do you think home prices are going to go over the next year if this continues to happen? They cannot go higher. I mean, you can only get them to go so high, if, but if people are, are not making more money or there's not enough people working to even buy homes, forget what the price are, but prices are or the working part-time, you can't expect these further home prices. You're now seeing the, the uh, real estate housing bulls saying, well, yeah, okay, prices will slow down a bit. Although they're not just going to slow down. They're going to come to a halt and they probably start to head down if things continue heading in the direction we're heading. They're just looking at, and they're looking at it the incorrect way, that somehow housing drives the economy and therefore housing drives housing itself. So if home prices are up, it just continues to work. It's like on a flywheel. It doesn't work that way. Now, that's cart before the horse. The housing will actually at some point have to react to what the economy is doing. The economy isn't doing well. The housing, housing has only done well because the rates are low. Now rates are higher what's the impetus to make home prices go up? The fact that they've been going up? You know, right. it's like saying you have a plane that's flying and two of the engines are out, but it's still flying well. And somebody says, what do you worry about? The plane's still flying. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's going yeah, and, on. And, and, and you scheme. know what? You bring up a great point. Housing, <clears throat> the housing market should actually be going up when the economy is actually going up at, at the same, you know, at the same pace, right? Yeah, relative, but, right. Relatively. But what we actually have going on is we have real estate going up are going up for an extended period of time because of just a low interest rate environment, which is an artificially, you know, uh, an artificial market that was created by the Fed. And I think the Fed, they, they, they didn't understand actually what, I mean, I think they knew, but I think that um, it was a little misguided to think that they could control things, you know, in a timeline and say, oh, well, now we've got these huge price increases in, in major cities across the country. You know what, we need to start talking about the economy turning around because, That'll allow for interest rates to naturally rise up a little bit, but I don't think they realized that how fast they were going to rise by the amount. We did, Ryan. Rise. You and I predicted this for two years. Yeah. Once they go, they go straight up. They go straight up. I mean, it's, and and you know, I've been getting the question almost every other day: Should I wait for interest rates to go back down before I buy? I said, Well, what makes you think interest rates are going to go back down? Well, they're they're too high right now. <laughs> is the answer that I'm getting. And so you have this, the house this, that you want that's in your sights. You should buy now because they're going to go higher. If 
you're in the market in general, you know, uh, you, you might not want to buy right now. You might want to wait and see where home prices go. Because if, if there is a lag, uh, the, the rates will rise, but the home prices won't go down right away. Yeah, and, and you know what? It, it, let's just say that people are in a position now where they're, you know, where they're <clears> unsure. They're not, they, they're, one way or the other, it doesn't really matter to them whether they move or not. I might say that you sit tight because guess what? With the Fed and all this paper talk, by the end of September, we're going to know what's going on there. And either interest rates are going to climb further, which is going to put, uh, you know, further downward pressure on home prices. Or the Fed is going to basically say, you know what, we kind of screwed the pooch here and we need to buy more so we, we can get interest rates back down. Because they basically know the only thing that's moving in the econ economy is real estate, and that was only because of interest rates. What happens if we take away real estate? There is nothing else, Lewis. There's nothing else. Well, you else. know what there is? There actually is. It's, it's, a, it's one that's it's aligned with it, car sales. I mean, car sales, you've got like a subprime crisis going on right now. Car sales are through the roof because – People are buying cars at low interest rates, and, and rates, you know, they're buying them on 72 months um, after the car is totally useless by then, uh, payment right. plans. So they're right. The, the economy is being boosted artificially by these low rates, and housing, you know, you take away those rates, it goes down. Same with the cars. Yeah, and, you know, as far as long term, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I hate, you know, trying to predict the future, but... I mean, it, it almost seems, Lewis, like, you know, we've already seen this happen before, right? And um, uh, why would we expect anything to be any different? I mean, all the signs are pointing. It's worse, towards... Ryan. It's it's a lot worse because they got very little pop out of this. They spent $3 trillion this time. They didn't just lower interest rates, and they didn't get anywhere near the housing bubble that they got in, in the mid, mid and early 2000s. This little bubble has already burst after spending $3 trillion in order to make it just stay alive a little longer, they don't have to spend another couple of trillion dollars. Hey, Ryan, the, the jobless number is out. And again, it's horrible. A, I think it's 169,000 jobs against expectations in the 180s, 190 range. And it's mostly retail and the food industry. Um, the civilian labor force participation rate edged down even more to 63.2%. The employment population ratio is unchanged at 58.6%. So no one's getting jobs, and more people are leaving the labor force. So I don't understand where this recovery talk comes from and how somehow employment is, is good. They're making well, less money, and there are they're fewer people working. Now, the unemployment rate is still at 7.3%. So that's a function right. of just people leaving the – there's not enough jobs being created, period. You cannot no, expect it, a recovery at 169,000 jobs a month when you're losing 330,000 a week. Well, what's interesting about that, Lewis, is so yesterday, you know, we lost um, a lot in pricing of interest rates. Mortgage-backed securities pricing got worse. But now that you're telling me that number, I can almost guarantee you that it's gonna, we're, we're going to gain back all of what we lost yesterday. But it, yep. it's, it's, this, it's this seesaw, you know what yep. I mean, of reports, back and forth, back and forth. And, and like I said, I don't want to say there's some sort of conspiracy theory or, or something going on here with the Fed, but all, it, it's almost like clockwork that every time we have some sort of, of, of what people think is a good report, right behind it comes something that then says, no, it's no, I, I just want to put you back in your place because we're, we're it's actually not getting better, it's getting worse. You know what and I mean? You see the hap yeah, and you see it happen with the price of gold and silver. Before a, a, um, a bad report comes out, meaning a good report, because it's just, if it's bad, that means the Fed will continue its QE, gold and silver go down. It gets right. taken down, and then you get this bad report, and it goes right back up. Absolutely. And it's the same thing with interest rates. They'll, they'll head back down. You know, they're trying to they're, – right now they're trying to put a cap on the interest rates through talking. And they've been very successful. It is a confidence game in talking the rates down and coupling it with the actions. But where they lost control, and you pointed it out, was when they started talking taper, didn't couple it with the actions, and basically they lost an entire point on the 10-year – just from talking, and that's not what they wanted to do. What no. they wanted to do was keep interest rates where they were. They wanted not to spend the money but still have the low interest rates because they say so. But yep. really what the market was listening to was the Fed saying, we're going to you know, continue to be accommodative, we're going to continue to do QE, and people said, good, your words meet your actions, we believe you interest rates stayed low. Once they said they weren't going to do it, they said, yeah, we believe you. And if you don't do it, we're not, paying, we're not going to stick around and get, and get less than 2% interest on the 10-year note. 
we're going to sell. And unless you start talking, like you say, Ryan, more positively about buying even more treasuries and keeping the rates low, we're not buying them. Yeah, because, I mean, they would have – investors have no other reason to even buy that 10-year, and at least they know, they know that the Fed's going to buy more of it because they, they basically, uh, you know, are going to just follow whatever they do because they're the lender. Interest-free risk. Right. They're the lender of only resort, and then they basically know that the Fed is backstopping everything that we do. Um, so they have no reason to, to not jump in with both feet if the Fed says, hey, you know, instead of $85 billion, let's just go ahead and make it 120 You know what I mean? Yeah, well, then you um, might buy. Then you might buy. And that's why I said that's the only thing that I can actually see that would give markets a clear sign that, you know what, guess what, the Fed must really think that the economy sucks. So you know right. what, then, Ryan, they, that, that little uh, outburst about wanting to taper may have cost them another 40 or $50 billion a month extra because that's what they – because had they, you said they would have been better off not saying anything, wait and see, wait and see, and continued and just said, yeah, we're going to continue the, um, the QE at uh, 85 a month. But if you remember it, at that time, there were a lot of people starting to make noises like, hey, when is all this going to end? So they were worried about, about losing confidence. So I think they said they wanted to do something to kind of show that this wasn't a permanent feature. But well, they're locked that, in. That, they're they're yeah, damned if they do, damned if they don't. That and the fact that, you know, I think it kind of scared them a little bit when they when they started seeing these property values increase, you know what I mean, at a, at a, at a pretty rapid pace. And they were thinking to themselves, well, you know, if we continue this, if we continue doing this, I mean, in the back of their mind, they they're, have to. They're creating asset we, bubbles, yes. Right. They're just creating these asset bubbles. And, and, you know, you cannot control these bubbles. You can't control them. It, 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 once they get started, you know, it, it could have actually just been for a, a year or two period of time that we've had this little ride where we had interest rates in the 3% levels. But now they're, they're, they're back into close to the 5% level. It changes everything. I mean, realistically, like, and I see this on a ground level, the difference between somebody being able to buy a $300,000 house and a $450,000 house, it's, it, it, that big of a difference, really. Um, now, will, as I suggested a couple weeks ago with adjustable rate mortgages, will they start to come back into play? Sure, they will. There will be start to be things, more creative products. Um, obviously, we've got FHA's guidelines, which basically they're allowing you to buy again after one year if you had a foreclosure or short sale. So there's going to be all, all sort of creative things that come from this with higher interest rates because guess what? When they start to see that, wow, our mortgage production has really fallen off the map. I, I don't know why this has happened. Well, guess what? The only thing that was driving it before was a low interest rate environment. Right. Um, and, 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 and anything short of, you know, the job situation turning around where we're creating, you know, millions more jobs. We're and in the right sector, then full-time jobs that pay more. Uh, yeah. And, I mean, a lot of – and we had even talked before, Lewis, where a lot of people were refinancing their home or selling their home and maybe doing home renovations or whatever it may be, that was made, it was it's basically an, an artificial spike in those sectors as well. So Unfortunately, when it stops though, Ryan, it's over. In other words, if people can't um, refinance and spend money, where are they going to get money? It's not from their job. So they're counting on the, the rates keeping people spending. But once they stop spending, because they haven't built a productive economy with good jobs, there's nothing left. And then it collapses, and it collapses down to zero. And then, uh, I mean, if you remember during the last bubble cycle, what happened was that actually once people, you know, basically had borrowed as, as much as they possibly could out of their house, they then turned to their credit cards and ran all those up and then was, was in a worse situation than they started in. You know what I mean? Right. So, well, it's the government it's a, on, a, on a larger scale. It's the same thing. Right. It's a vicious cycle. And, and I mean, but, essentially – I got the ten year the ten year you're right, Ryan, went from two point nine five down to two point eight seven. Yeah, exactly. So that's and that's and that's why I said it. I mean it's almost like clockwork that I can you can almost sit here and say, Oh, yesterday's report said this, today's report's gonna say something completely different. I mean Well, imagine if the ADP not the ADP, no, the non forms payroll today was like two hundred thousand, rates would be over three yep. percent. Oh I mean and and that's and that's a great point, Louis, because you see, we have you know, what we consider bad news today with the, with this number, but yet rates aren't going to just all of a sudden improve by a half a percent. You know what I mean? We might get an eighth, an eighth or a quarter back today, but let us right. have The move some, is inexorably you know, higher. Exactly. Let us have some, some news that makes it look like the economy turning around and rates would go and move a quarter to a half in a day. And, and it's just, that's why I'm always like, if you're, if you're, 
you're able to move today and you're and you can afford that payment, you can afford to buy that house that you want to live in, you're happy with all those those you know, the answers to all those questions and they're yes, then do it today. Don't sit around and wait and try to, you know, think about, oh well maybe interest rates are gonna go down a half over the next six months or so because guess what? It, they may they may jump up a whole other point between now and then. Right. And none of us, none of us have control over this, not even the Fed anymore, because as we've seen, just by them opening their mouth, rates have risen up almost 2%. Yeah, and they're, oh, they were close to yesterday. It was like, what, 4.75 on the 30 year? 4.75%? Yep. And They've been on low threes. And what I've noticed even more is that investors and banks and lenders, they're even hedging even more. You know what I mean? Because they're so uncertain of what's going on, they're not even passing through the coupon rates. Not even nowhere close to where they're actually they actually right. are. I mean, the Fannie Mae thirty or four percent coupon right now is that is trading at a par is considered one hundred. It's one hundred two point two eight. So that's essentially what's going to be. You know, you can sell those coupons to Fannie Mae if you're a lender, right? But why? all of a sudden are we at close to like the 5% range on these Fannie Mae's because they're hedging. They're, they're holding so much money. I mean, so right. who's really the ones making the money? It's, it's the lenders and it's Fannie Mae on the backside there. I mean, they're, they're hedging big time and that ultimately leads to higher interest rates for the consumer. And Ryan, you um, had the same exact situation when the gold and silver prices got smashed down. Um, good luck trying to buy it at those prices, but uh, because there were large premiums in Hong Kong and the United States and in India, you couldn't buy the the gold or silver at the at the spot price anywhere near it. There were massive premiums, which almost made it seem like the price had never gone down at all. Right, like it had to go that, down thirty percent for it to be a real smash down. Yep. Yeah, so, uh, you know, are we going to get interest rates that are going to go back to that 4% level? Probably not. Um, barring, Unless they do what you say. They come exactly. boldly out and say, well, this is the a Fed, Yeah, exactly. The Fed, when they, when they have that meeting, instead of coming out in that meeting and say, you know, hey, well, you know, we, we talked about tapering. Um, it's actually not going to happen because we don't have the data to support tapering at this point. And no matter they never fact, did. They yeah, never did. Well, they don't now and they never did. Right, but they need to be – essentially they're saying that, you know, they've, they've felt like things are improving, but they need to actually come out and say, hey, we actually feel like, they feel like things are not improving. We feel like things are getting much worse, and we feel like we have to, to do something to help boost this economy, and that's going to be – we're going to buy more mortgage-backed securities and more treasuries. We're going to buy Ryan, more I think you're right. If they just come out and they say, hey, we were wrong, we're just going to keep it at 85, the rates go up anyway. 85 billion. Yep. They're going to have to do what you say. They can't just say we were wrong. We're going to just keep QE going a little while longer. That's going to spook people because they're going to say, yeah, but it's going to end soon. So rates are going to go higher. They're going to have to come out boldly and say, there's no end in sight here. We are not out of this, out of the woods yet. Employment is horrible. It's heading in the wrong direction. It heads in the wrong direction every month. The only number that gets better, Ryan, is that uh, initial jobless claims report. And they keep saying, oh, Fewer people get fired. Well, yes, fewer left to fire. Yeah. Yep. And, and so where are the new jobs? Where's the real GDP? Now, the, by the way, wasn't this last uh, time the GDP included all kinds of new calculations? Oh, yeah. That actually added like a point that if you didn't have those calculations to the GDP, they wouldn't have been there. And I think they added things like um, intellectual labor. Like if somebody yep. writes a screenplay, they count that in the GDP. Yep, that's that's a cost of production. That's not a um, that's not producing anything. That's an expense that you have to pay somebody before you produce something. Yeah, I mean, and you know, I kind of you could actually take the common sense approach to how, how the economy is doing, and take out all strip all these reports out. Pretend like we didn't we didn't we don't have access to any of these employment numbers or anything. Just go <laughs> out there and talk to people and find out how many people actually have stable jobs. How many people have gotten furloughed or are working less time now? How many people, you know, are, are now trying to, you know, sell their house because they can't afford it anymore? I How mean, many people are trying to get jobs and have been unemployed for a year or two? Right, or can no longer collect unemployment because they ran their they ran too much, you know, too much time at this point, and now they're they're they have no clue what they're going to do. I mean, these just by hearing these stories, and even in the metropolitan areas, even where I'm at in Northern Virginia, DC Metro. I've got government contractors that are going out of business, going bankrupt because the government basically 
that they're at a, basically at a stalemate for a lot of contracts. They're not giving out money or they're canceling contracts. I mean, it, it is not good. And we don't need these job reports to tell us, hey, things look like they're turning around because we know that they're not. However, this is what's being pushed out to mainstream media. This is what they want to push and peddle to make, think, make everybody think that everything is, is, is rosy. But stock market would give everybody the indicator that everything is just fine, and it's not. It's not. It's amazing, Ryan, how they've, they've spun this into people thinking. I mean, you hear the word recovery. It's not as strong as we would like. It's not there at all. Yeah, recovery, it, there is none. I mean, we, we had an artificial spike in things, and which, is, which was temporary. That's it. And then now it's stopped. Now it's completely stopped. So where, where are we headed from, from here? You know, and, and do we really think that, I mean, like I said, the only ammunition that the Fed has, that the president has at his disposal, is to give the Fed more authority to, to basically print more money, to push more money out there, to board, buy more mortgage-backed securities and treasuries. That's the only ammunition they had. Yeah, and you know one and, way of doing it? You start the war with, uh, with Syria, you have to spend a billion dollars on that, and then, oh, you know, it, was, it wasn't as easy as we thought. It wasn't a simple in-and-out 10-day thing. We're going to have yep. to do more. We're going to have to bomb more targets. We're going to have to put boots on the ground. And the next thing you know, you're spending all that money on that, and people kind of take their eye off the ball of what's happening. And that's what always happens in war. You get the population kind of distracted. And at the beginning of a war, everyone loves the president. Everyone, they may be against it before, it, but everyone rallies around it. And it, that honeymoon lasts, I don't know, a few months, maybe a year or so. And then they start to lose interest, and they get annoyed with they get war-weary. Now, I think yep. this time people are war-weary before it even started. Um, and it looks like they're going to go ahead anyway. And this will actually be a kind of unique in American history where it seems like the president is going to go ahead with or without congressional authorization. And he set himself up for a rebuke because if they vote against it, he's saying, well, okay, well, <laughs> it's nice that you voted against it. I'm going to go ahead and do it. Now, that sets the stage for a kind of a very divided Congress going into the, um, the debt ceiling talks, because right. if he's going to be heavy-handed there, and then you have some kind of coalition of progressive Democrats and uh, libertarian Republicans that voted against the war, who knows the types of deals they're making behind the scenes right now coming up to the debt ceiling um, talks. So this whole thing isn't good, but it seems like they need to have this kind of war. And it yep. seems that the, if they don't have it, something, someone's, something, some piece of the puzzle doesn't get put in. Because I really don't believe that anyone believes that, and, and the polls show this, that it's in our national interest that absolutely we must go and um, bomb Syria. Because you could pick any place in the world and find someone to bomb if you had to. Something's right. going wrong in the world. This thing has been kind of thrust upon us as almost unnecessary. And uh, what's interesting is it seems like Congress and the, and the population doesn't want to go along with it, but it seems like it's going to happen anyway. And there's a billion dollars that's going to be spent <laughs> no, no matter what. Right. So you're saying essentially that this is a necessary distraction uh, based upon Not where we're Not just a distraction, at. but it's a necessary outlay of funds. There's, there's some reason they have to – it has to be done for a number of reasons. And it doesn't yeah. seem like they're, they can be talked out of it. And I think the more they talk about doing it – I see the news in this, uh, this morning. Now Iran is starting to make threats. Well, they wouldn't have made any threats. Right. <laughs> they weren't even in the picture. It was almost yeah. like designed to get them riled up. And then Russia or China is sending warships into the area. Well, none of this would be happening if we didn't say we're going to bomb them and telegraph that we're going to bomb them, telegraph yep. what places we're going to bomb. It's almost like they're saying, you know, if you, if you were really serious about executing a war, you wouldn't telegraph everything in advance about when you might do it. It, it yeah. just seems all too contrived to give everybody a chance to get their alliances built up and to make this into a big deal. Yeah, and once it's a big then, deal, you, you have to go through with it. Well, and then you had what uh, Russian President Putin who basically told President Obama at the G20 meeting that if the U.S. hit Syria, that Russia would support Syria. So I mean, right, it's, it's, and also they had evidence that the rebels did it. No one even knows who did the gassing, why they did the gassing, how bombing of certain areas is going to stop the gassing. 
Are you going right. to bomb the, the chemical weapons themselves, which should create an even bigger problem? None of it's been really explained other than, you know, they show pictures of a couple of people that are, you know, severely injured and you feel bad for them and you want to do something, but you don't know what it is you can do. Well, yep. You bomb the country that did it. Well, I, <laughs> I don't know how that helps. No, I, I definitely don't think it helps at all. And I think it's probably a stupid move to get involved, period. But um, as you said, I guess um, their way of thinking is that they, they don't want to basically consider the the U.S. weak by any means. And there's a lot of people that feel like we should jump in to the middle of the We have to now. I mean, we're making all this noise. And yeah. now all of a sudden, if the president can't, can't – if the president doesn't go through with it now, going into the debt ceiling a negotiation, he's like a lame duck. He has yeah. to be able to say, look, because he, he said this before on many occasions, if Congress won't act, I'll act. And he's done things like the Mini Dream Act. He's, he's, he's done certain things on his own executive orders. If they rebuke him on this, and this is a war, they'll rebuke him on the debt ceiling too. And then you've got Obamacare issues. They want to defund that. So it's going to get messy no matter what. If he decides, you know what? I'm a constitutional law scholar. I realize that Congress is the one that have the right to declare war, not the president. Uh, I'm going to step back, and I'm not going. He's weak then, too, yep. Be- because he's the one who claimed he drew the line in the sand. This is unacceptable. The world's behind us. And then he looks over his shoulder and says, well, France is, and Turkey is, and Lebanon. But other than that, well, the world's behind us. So he's got a problem, and when people are faced with a problem where they're backed into a corner, they lash out. Yeah. What do you think he's going to do? Well, he's going to do what he wanted to do in the first place. Well, what is extremely interesting at this point is that the timing of this, where we're headed right basically into that September meeting where the Fed's talking about tapering. I mean, Absolutely. You know what I mean? The we predicted is, this, that they would come up with impeccable. something. Yeah. We thought, I thought it was going to be Egypt because that was what was going out of control at the time. Uh, you know, when we talked about them coming up with a pretense. Yeah, I mean, they could start the bombs flying in the, right around the time of the Fed meeting. The Fed can just punt at that point. They don't yep. even have to comment on the economy. They can just say they foresee, they don't know what the impact of any type of military action will be. They don't know if it will be prolonged. They don't know the impact on the economy. So the prudent thing to do would be to keep things the way they are. Yeah, and, and you know, when you do have these, when you have these, these, these uh, you know, world things going on, uh, yesterday even, I mean, basically when the, uh, uh, Putin came out yesterday and said he was supporting Syria, that caused traders to further discount the likelihood that there would be a strike in the near term. Right. Um, so it basically, that reduced the fear factor premium in bonds, and that actually put downward pressure on mortgage-backed securities, which made interest rates get worse. But if we, if president, like you said, if the president actually does come out and say, you know what, I'm going to do this anyway, that would actually, once again, put uh, let interest rates get better because it's going to put fear in the markets and people are going to, to put your Safe money back in the bonds. Back to the, exactly, right. back in the bonds and mortgage back securities. That, that could ultimately definitely happen. And that could happen for an extended period of time because, once again, we're talking about war again, right? You know, maybe that's so, the reason they want the war is not just a distraction, but it's to do, and they don't have the money to spend by the Fed, but if they spend it through the military and it puts people back into bonds and it sends a message to the world, the dollar is strong, the U.S. is the policemen of the world, then the interest rates go back down again. Yeah. And they, don't, and they don't have to go down because of uh, QE infinity. They go down because the U.S. is exercising its might around the world. And uh, there's uncertainty in the world. But if there's uncertainty in the world, I want to be on the side of the U.S. Let me have some of those treasuries. Right. And then the Fed comes in right behind them and says, hey, guess what, guys? We're not going to taper um, because, you right. know, things aren't getting better, which, you know, just even more – facilitates what you were just talking about. We're going to – we're going to – interest rates would, would fall um, a little bit because of that. Yeah, I right. mean – And then the economy does thing. well, and then everybody figures, eh, so what? They're bombing in Syria. It doesn't bother me. The economy is getting better. <laughs> right. right. You know, because that can help the economy. We know, you know, the Keynesian concept, our wars are good for the economy. They claim that, you know, World War, uh, World War II ended the Great Recession. That's, that's a misnomer. And that somehow, you know, if you just blow stuff up and build it, build it again – you're, you're making work, and therefore that's good for the economy. So in the short term, you could see a boost, you know, if there was some military spending, there was some military action, and interest rates went lower. Then the housing market can kind of snap back, and, you know, it's been kind of 
on its last legs probably the last few weeks because of interest rates. But if interest rates go back and then the Fed says that they're going to keep rates low because they're going to continue QE, then they don't even have to do what you say. They don't even have to increase the, the amount of QE. They can just rely on the fact that there's a war going on and they're still doing QE and interest rates are low. And, you know, if you don't see too many pictures in the news of what's happening in Syria, no one's really going to care. Right now, people, what they're trying to do is they're showing pictures of people in distress so that you do care. Right. And that you support yep. the war. Well, but once it once, starts, but once it starts, they, they won't show anybody getting hurt. Right. No. <laughs> yep. Well, you know, I, I think this is definitely something that we'll, we'll have to pay close attention to because, I mean, like you said, um, this could be exactly what they wanted all along. No and, coincidence. It is no coincidence yeah. that Syria, that guy's been in power I don't know how many years. He's done whatever he's been doing for however many years he's been doing it. They know him what he does. And there's a civil war going on there. Right. It didn't all and you know it's interesting, if it was so critical that um we get involved and they were gonna like strike, I don't know, two weeks ago or a week ago, then they decide, Well, you know what, we'll wait. <laughs> but it can't be that critical if right. they're not willing to wait and talk about, you know, what day they're going to go in and, and bomb Syria. Because that gives them time to move stuff around. It, it doesn't really make any sense. It just makes sense that they need to do it. And it has to happen in September, but it didn't have to happen immediately. It's not like millions of people are at risk, and we must act yesterday, right. otherwise millions more will die. Or the United States so, is facing an imminent attack, we must act now. They're saying, we've got to do this, but I've got to get everything lined up properly. <laughs> so you're you're saying that this is like one of those like perfectly orchestrated things, and 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 who else is in on it, right? Who else around the rest of the world is in on this? You know what I mean? Because they're they're telegraphing so much that it almost seems like you know <laughs> that there has to be more than just us in on this. Um, I mean, I, I don't know. It, it, there's it's just. It's I think of, the Western uh, the Western um, leaders wanted you know, for whatever reason they have to. Um, to get involved. But what's interesting, what happened in England, the parliament voted against it. And then the prime minister said, oh, all right, sorry, won't do that one. Um, but that really left the United States in the lurch, too, because they always count on England. If the United States right. is going to go bomb someone, the RAF is, you know, right behind them. Yep. And then they backed out, and then you had Kerry come out and say, well, France is with us, maybe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> It just seems very odd that uh, it's all coming to a head, and we knew something would play into it because they really can't, with a straight face, taper and say two things. One, we're tapering because the economy is getting better. And two, when we taper, not a big deal because the economy is getting better. The, the markets will take it in stride. Absolutely false. You yep. taper, and you, you don't even have to say anything. I mean, not only, the Fed doesn't have to say anything. They just have to say you know, we've decided to reduce our bond purchase from 85 to $65 billion and don't say anything, the market collapses. They can say whatever they want, that they might change it back to 85 if conditions warrant. That'll be, seem like they're clueless if they then go ahead and taper. So you've pointed out all along, Ryan, you think they're just not going to. I've been saying no exit, they can't, but I've been tempted to think they might try it. But yeah. now I think they realize even trying it is too dangerous. Yeah, I mean... I mean trying, hinting anything about it, you know, even going down the path of, of, of saying, well, and it was interesting because I believe it was one of Bernanke's last speeches. He had said something like, we don't plan on tapering at all until the economic data turns around. And we also are, are you know, holding the right to, to uh, basically more QE is basically what he was saying. You know what I mean? If things get worse. Well, guess what? If we have a war. They got worse. And, yeah. Yeah. They got worse. The problem is if they get and, worse, though, they lose face because – Wait a minute. You've been doing this for five years. You spent three trillion dollars. Where's the recovery? And now you're telling me you got to do more. See, that could make rates go higher too at some point. Well, you, but I would have thought that that would have already happened. I mean, wouldn't you think that the Fed would have already lost face at this point? I mean, no, doing because all they're the, the only. Well, you know what happens when they lose face? You bring the military and you remind people. <laughs> yeah. There's a reason people view the dollar as a safe haven because they call the shots. Now, we, we have the military power. And that's, that's basically why. I mean, there's nothing backing the dollar at all other than the, you know, the good faith and credit of the United States, which, as Greenspan says, is we can always print money. And the reason people will take it is if you don't, 
<laughs> guess who has all the guns? Yeah. You know, I, I think a lot of this has to do with this uh, kind of challenge that the Russians, Chinese, Iranians are kind of trying to put together to challenge U.S. dollar hegemony. And, and you know, they decide to trade amongst themselves, not using dollars. You know, if they can if they can present to the world an alternative, that's very harmful to the United States because then we can't spend as much money as we want to spend because we don't have the same market for it. I mean, the dollar has got a global market. People have to have the dollar. They, they Everyone is involved in the dollar. If they start trading amongst themselves using the Chinese RMB, they start using gold instead, um, the Russian ruble, whatever it is, then the demand for the dollar goes down, and then the inflation all comes back to the United States because people say, I don't need these dollars, and they try to get rid of them. And, you know, So that's, that's another issue. Is the United States needs to maintain that world reserve currency status. Um, they're not doing it by holding, backing it by gold. They're really doing it by you know, the petrodollar arrangement where people need dollars for international currency. And Iran is at the, at the, at the height of like, being against that. Yeah. Iran is Iran does not want to, you know they sell their oil for whatever you want to give them for it and they'll take gold for it they don't take dollars for it well so, and, and, and you know Obama might know thing. that this is his, his this is his you know his last straw here too I mean get involved in this it, it can become a distraction from, uh, you know across the country people are not paying attention to it maybe keep maybe keep the you know basically all the eyes and ears off of the economy for a while. Um, things will just stagnate while helping the economy a bit too short term exactly while helping it short term it'll get him through his term where basically um his uh his legacy goes on you know uh untarnished i guess well his um, his issue right now his legacy and where he's getting it the most uh on his legacy is that for, at least as far as the left is concerned that he's pursued many of the same policies as george bush and bombing countries you know, was you know he won the Nobel Peace Prize. That wasn't what right. was supposed to be his forte. Um, right. So he he's in a in a tough spot in terms of his political support and and as you say his legacy. Um, he would prefer. He even said this. He said it in a question. To, in um, they asked him in Sweden. You know, you're a Nobel Prize winner. Why? How do you square this? And he he said, well, you know, I'd rather be talking about um, kids' education and preschool. Of course he would. Because, you know, but somehow he's got himself mixed up in this, and it really doesn't square with the image that he presented, or I think that he even wants to present to the world. And I, th- right. I think he seems very uncomfortable trying to um, make the case. Yeah. I think he was—he's just hoping Congress will say, "Well, I say so," and so let's just get this over with because I have to do this. Right. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I. It just seems like. We have been saying all along and bringing it all back together is the Fed has to keep spending money because the economy is weak and they will come up with some reason to continue to spend it. But they wanted to say all along that they weren't just going to keep spending money because they didn't want to lose confidence. You know, it's that whole either we we lose confidence by saying we're going to spend or, you know, forever. Yep. Or we stop spending and we lose confidence because everything collapses. So which one? Which one are you going to take? And the, the latter is much more frightening. You just stop spending and everything collapses. And they say, "What are you crazy? You allowed this to happen." Yeah. So they'd rather just print their way <laughs> into oblivion and hope that you know it happens on somebody else's watch. Yeah. The well, second... while all the time that inflation remains in check, according to all the reports, remember. Oh, yeah, so, but oil is up, housing is up, stock yep. market is up. You know, that's a misnomer that some the iPad is down, I suppose, the way they, <laughs> they calculate the way they calculate. I mean, there is inflation and if people make less money then even if the inflation rate is, is, is flat to slightly positive, the fact that they make less money means to them there is inflation. Right. If you used to make yep. if you used to make a hundred dollars and now prices that used to be a hundred dollars cost one hundred and two, but you make ninety six. That's huge. You yeah. lost the difference between ninety six and one hundred two, even though the inflation rate is only two percent. Which is which is a lot, a lot of what's going on right now, especially what we talk about, you know, with uh, full time workers that are being converted to part time workers and government workers that have been furloughed, so they're you know they they got their paycheck cut by thirty percent. Um, I mean that's going on all over the place. So 
you know, just looking at it from that angle, I mean, you know, we're we're not in a better spot than we were. We're not going. We're not even headed to a better spot. And spending um, and more QE isn't going to change that, and less QE is definitely not going to change that. Nope. Nope. So, so what do they do? The only thing they can do is distract and say, well, there's this Syrian dictator, and we better go take care of him. Well, war has proven that we can distract for very long periods of time, right? So. Oh, sure. The, the housing is, bubble went on during the Iraq war. Exactly. So the question then becomes, okay, so if everything we're saying actually, you know, actually comes to fruition and actually takes place, what, you know, what is, is going to be um, the, the long-term prognosis for the housing market? You know what I mean? If we know that this is going to take place, do we, do we think that we can then keep interest rates into the 4% level? Well, by hook or crook, isn't that what they want to do? I think the whole so. the whole uh, centerpiece of the economic recovery hinges on low interest rates and people buying houses. Yep. And that's what they need to have happen. Well, I I wanted to transition just real quickly. There was a, a recent study by the Joint Center for Housing Studies at Harvard University that addressed um, whether home ownership was still the American dream or not. Um, their paper was called "Reexamining the Social Benefits of Home Ownership After the Housing Crisis." <laughs> And I thought it's kind of interesting because I feel like we're in another one. But um, yeah. the homeowner, it, it was actually within the paper, it was basically there's three things that were outlined. Uh, homeownership still preferred over renting, even after the dramatic loss of equity and the high foreclosure rates. The early evidence suggests that people seem to believe that over the long run, owning is still preferable to renting. The long term cultural preference for owning seems to have weathered the recent housing crisis. And you know what, Louis? I mean, I think that owning a home is fantastic as long as you're doing it for the right reasons, right? And you can afford I mean, it. And you can afford to do Owning it. Owning a yacht is fantastic, too, if you can afford it. People always prefer to own something that they can call their own and that they can make their own and that they can, you know, raise a family in their own. I mean, that's what people want. And, and so that's never going to change. Will the America? I mean, the fact that you're buying the house to make money on it, which is what it, you know, what people considered part of the American dream a while ago, is no longer the case. You should not be buying a house to make money, Okay. If you're doing like gold. You're not supposed to be buying gold to make money. You're supposed to be buying gold and putting it in a vault in case there's a problem to preserve your value. Absolutely. It's not supposed to make yeah. money. It doesn't pay dividends. It's supposed to well, sit you know, in, a, in a vault somewhere and, and, and just hold on to your, your purchasing power. Just like a house. You know, it's, you're going to yeah. live in it. And even when you're having conversations with people, Lewis, wouldn't, isn't it almost – I mean, I don't want to say it's, it's looked down upon, but when somebody says – hey, I rent my house versus I own my house. Oh, you haven't done well. Exactly. You're looked at a little bit differently. So that leads to the next one. Americans still expect to be homeowners. The researcher on home line expectations supports the conclusion that very large percentage of Americans still expect to buy a home at some time in the future. Of course Even millennials held that same aspiration. They're saying, see, so it still exists. Even the young of today who have no jobs, student loan debt, and no ability to get a mortgage, they still want one. Of course they do. They want to be movie stars and... Rock stars and, and baseball players, that doesn't mean they're going to have the ability to be those things. And, and I mean, when you're growing up as a kid, if your parents own a home, I mean, that, that's something you would, you're, you're going to want as well. I mean, Unless they lose it change. and they get tossed out of it and you didn't like that experience. But you know what? I, after all of that, even after all the bad things that have happened to people, they, they're still trying to find a way, well, okay, how can I buy again? I, be, I think it's become, okay, socially acceptable to have these hardships because of all the government programs that have been put in place, Lewis, to make it basically like, okay, you know, if you have these hardships, don't worry. We got HARP. We got HAMP. We have everything else to try to help you. That's you know what? Good. If those don't work for you, just go ahead and short sell your house because I'll turn around and one year later, FHA will lend to you. We'll, we'll, lend, we'll give you another loan to right. buy another house. So they're, they're, The reason they push it, it's not for the social reasons. They push it because they make money off of it. Absolutely. That would be the only reason for them to do it. Yeah, they also um, try to claim social reasons, like kids who, who live in rental houses, and they, they show they don't do as well in school. Well, yeah, that's because a lot of people that live in rental houses may live in the, in the poorest rental house, but renting as, in, and of its, in and of itself doesn't right. make somebody a, a second-class citizen. Yep. The last part of the, of the paper, with the, the third point, was that younger Americans uh, more desirous of home ownership. Moreover, the finding that younger renters and owners are more likely than older counterparts to expect to own both well for the future of the housing market. Um, well, yeah, but guess what happens when the young people don't have jobs? Does that bode well for the future of the housing market? No, it doesn't. <laughs> That's you know? industry propaganda when they say that. I saw something like that online yesterday that millennials are still interested in buying a home, and I said, yeah, okay, but 
first they got to get jobs and they have to get rid of their student debt before they can do that. I mean, just well, because they're know, excited about it doesn't mean it's going to happen. It's it's well, like when the Brooklyn Dodgers they always wanted to win the pennant, but they never did. Yeah, and it's not only that, but I mean, the, these reports are great for um, for National Association of Realtors and everybody else to go out there and, and and you know push this push this out there to the masses, right? I mean, hey, look, every everybody that's young still wants to buy a house. You should want to do the same, right? Well, and you know, you and I talk all the time. I mean. I'm a real estate agent. This, I mean, I can help people buy homes, but I'm not the guy that's out there telling, you know, everybody should buy a home because it's not for everybody. I mean, if you don't have a job, you can't buy a house. If you have a part-time job, you probably can't buy a house. If you have a job but you have terrible credit, you can't buy a house. There's you have a job things. and you've taken a pay cut, you can't yeah, buy a house. You if you were able to buy a house two months ago, but rates have gone from 3 and a half to 5%, you can't buy one. Right. So how can you buy a house? Well, basically you have to have kept your job, have a stable job still for the last two years. You have to have probably some money saved up. You've got to have great credit. You know what I mean? You've got to have qualifying ratios. You can't have too much debt. I mean, there's so many things that have to line up to actually buy a home. Uh, I think that that's what's frustrating many people today. Um, but with all that being said, we still, we still have interest rates that are sub 5%, which is fantastic. I think that that is something that's great. I mean, until rates get to 6%, I'm still going to say that I feel like that they're fantastic rates, okay? Um, now, if, if you don't have a job to support the payment at those interest rates on the on the home that you want, then it's a different story. Right. Um, but, you know, if, if you do, if you do have that income and you have that stability, and I would suggest buying now because guess what? You, you can lock yourself in at those low fixed rates for an extended period of time. Now, let's say, worst, you know, or actually best case scenario, best case scenario, where we do go to war, the Fed does start buying more and more inspected securities, and interest rates then shoot down. Instead of 5%, they're now 3.5% all over again. Guess what? Refinance them to your lower rate. Absolutely. That's, you know and that's I mean? going to be temporary, too, because the war has to end, you know, and the rates have to go higher. They're just for delaying the inevitable. So any chance you get where there's a little break in the action where rates start to go back down, jump on it. You can jump back in. And, that, and that's more of my point is, is don't make the decision based upon, you know, hey, I think within the next year they're going to come back down to three and a half because what if they don't? Then you're basically, you're really stuck on the sideline and you have nowhere to go. Um, and, you know, that really just, I think a lot of this has to do with sitting down with professionals so that you can lay out all the options. They can lay out all the options, the mortgage options, the real estate options. You know exactly what you're getting yourself into. You can make a decision today based upon where you're at today, not where you're going to be five years from now. Um, and, you know, if that's a good decision for you and your family, then by all means take advantage of home ownership. But if you're buying a home to make money on it, please do not do that. Do not do that unless you're an investor. If you're an investor that plans on renting that property out and you've got positive cash flow, by all means you're, you're welcome to do that. But if you're just the average American that's going to buy their home, um, you're going to do that to have a stable environment for your family. Um, you can live there, do the things that you want to do to that house for the long term. If you make some money on the house over the long term, that's great. But guess what? You you can fix in your, your long-term housing costs for a 30-year period, which to me is the most important thing to do. Um, we're coming up on the end of the show, Lewis. I appreciate you tuning in and helping out with the discussion as always. Um, can you give our listeners your web address where you're, you, they can um, check out your blog? Because I know you always have uh, a good blog post every single week. And give them that information and how they connect, connect with you. Well, Ryan, thanks for the opportunity. They can go to smoggled.com, S-M-A-U-L-D-G-L-D.com, and you can check out the, the, the site. There's generally a blog post or two a week, as Ryan mentioned, on current economic situations and how it impacts the housing market. There's also occasional um, real estate marketing tips for real estate agents. And you can contact me through the site. My, if you go to the About section, you can read about my background, and you can get my phone number and email address there. Thank you, everybody, for listening in today, and thank you, Ryan. Thanks, Lewis. Thank you, guys. If you guys want to have any questions, concerns, um, or anything we discussed today, you can reach out to me personally at 877-245-2030. We're at the website at realestate360live.com. That's where we have and we store all of the podcasts from the previous week as well as this week's show. We'll go up there later this week. If you have any other questions, like I said, I'm here to help. Have a fantastic weekend, guys. We'll be talking to you next week.